spinning around and we are live. Hello, Dr. Alison Macbeth. Welcome to Harley Street Emporium. This Hi, is your thanks for having me. <laughs> my pleasure. Your first one with us. Now, let me just briefly explain to people who you are. You are a BMS accredited GP with interest in the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, as well as breast cancer. And in fact, you work as, is in, in what I hadn't actually really heard of these before, but a, a, a breast specialty clinic in the NHS and you also work privately with the very lovely Alice Duffy at Health in Menopause. So you're sort of covering all sorts of things, which is amazing and very helpful. Do you think that many people know about these special breast clinics or only people who've, who've got breast cancer? Um, so there's not many of us. So essentially, I started life as a GP with a special interest in women's health. And then I kind of veered more into breast surgery. So I am a speciality doctor in breast surgery. And then I realized that, you know what, there was all these women that were really struggling with their breast surgery treatment. And I just thought, why does um, every unit not have a menopause specialist attached to it? Because it's, it's one of the biggest issues that we have. So because I was the GP in the unit seeing all these patients, I just thought, well, so I was getting them all funneled to me. So I thought I need to qualify as a, as a menopause specialist so then I can persuade management to let me start this menopause clinic. So, so I'm, yeah, I'm a British Menopause Society accredited accredited menopause specialist as well as a breast uh, physician and yeah I run a specialist menopause clinic for our breast patients so breast cancer patients family history of breast cancer that sort of thing um, and as far as I'm aware I think we're the only one in Scotland there's there's a few in the country there's one in London there's one in Liverpool there's one in Bath there's not many specialist menopause clinics specifically set up in breast clinic and we need more yeah i would say so absolutely i thought i'd divide this into sort of two sections so first of all we'll start off with the you know the general genital urinary syndrome and menopause and what it does to people and then move on to the to the cancers sort of specifically so in general what is the genital urinary syndrome of, men, of menopause and how does it affect our pelvic floor so in the old days, we used to call it atrophic vaginitis, which is was essentially just dry vagina. Um, and actually, I think it's really important to get the terminology right because um, so many women come into my clinic and in Scotland, they call it flowers. And they come in and they say, I have a dry flower and I no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's really important to start off with getting the terminology right. So the, the vulva or the, the labial lips on the outside and vaginas inside. Because um, it's to treat it properly, you need to know which bit you're treating. But essentially in the old days, it was dry vagina. Now we know it's not just the vagina and the vulva, it is the bladder and the urethra, which is the tube that goes from the vagina into the bladder. And so symptoms of genital urinary syndrome are things like um, labial resorption. So basically the labial lips, they start, they basically shrink and they resorb. So women can't sit, they can't go on their bikes, um, really uncomfortable to wipe themselves. They get all this kind of micro tears, so tiny, tiny wee tears in the vagina. So the vaginal dryness. They can get vaginal discharge as well. And so, you know, when I ask women, are you having any dry vagina? They say no, but actually they're just having a change in their discharge. And I was always taught um, a dry vagina weeps. And, and it's true, it just changes that discharge. Um, so you can get difference in the smell of the vagina. Um, you can, you know, constantly need the loo, running to the toilet. I mean, I think we've all been there, got to the front door and trying to get your key in the lock. And you're like, oh, my God, I can't make it to the toilet in time. I'm going to wee myself. So it's kind of that urgency frequency up in the middle of the night, weeing, you know, can't sleep because, you you know, as soon as you come back down to, to bed, you need to get back up for the wee again. Um, mm. You know, it's it's a whole catalogue of things. It's prolapse, um, itching. A lot of women think that they're having thrush. So they go and buy buckets full of caniston. And 
thrush is actually not very common in the menopause unless a woman has something like diabetes or in, has on loads of antibiotics. Um, you know, thrush will give you this white, it kind of cottage cheese-like discharge. If you're not getting that, it's very unlikely to be thrush and it's more likely to be this genital urinary syndrome of the menopause. Mm, I walk for years with that, you know, wrongly treating myself with canniston. Everyone does it. I, mean, I, I was guilty myself. <laughs> we all did it. Well, I've been there. <laughs> it's not much fun. I think the thing that I, I found, I had this very, very badly, which is why I, I, I take a huge interest in this because I really don't want anybody else to go through what I went through. I was that woman who couldn't see it, who couldn't walk properly, forget about having sex. It was no fun. Um, is there, I, people tend to go, oh, you know, it's just a little bit of dryness. It doesn't really matter. It, it is so much more than that, isn't it? I mean, what you've described there can actually really interfere with people's quality of life. Yeah, I mean, it causes devastation. You know, people, can't, as I say, they can't have sex with a partner. They can't be intimate. So it causes relationship problems. Uh, at Everyday in Breast Clinic, I see women who haven't had sex since they were diagnosed, you know, two, three years ago. Their marriages have collapsed because they can't be intimate. Um, you know, I had one lady the other day, she used to cycle to work. She can't cycle to work. Um, it's just so much more than vaginal dryness. And if you think about it, if you're really sore and itchy all day, that's that in itself is absolutely miserable. Mm. Well, you can't concentrate. You can't sit. You can't. It wakes you up at night. It, I mean, it, it, it interferes with your sleep. And I know people are probably thinking that, you know, well, you know, it doesn't have dryness, get over it. But it is actually really very seriously disruptive. For people who don't have cancer, what are the regular treatments that, that we can access? So I think the most important thing is to get that moisture back into the vagina. Um, so you would start off with a good vaginal moisturizer and don't go to the supermarket and grab any old lube or moisturizer off the shelves actually most of them probably have no business being anywhere near a woman's vagina. So you want to use a good quality product like Yes. Yes is one of the best things. And for most, I think most areas, it's a bit of a postcode lottery, but I think most areas, certainly in Scotland, and I think most areas in England now, it can be prescribed under the NHS. So you've got your Yes vaginal moisturiser, and then you've got your Yes lubricant. So lubricant is for when you want to have sex. And there's different ones. There's oil-based, there's water-based. Um, oil-based is more thicker, longer lasting, but it can interfere with um, using condoms. So you just got to be really, you know, you, you would use a water-based if you're going to use condoms. So it's, it's your lubes for sex. It's your moisturiser. You wouldn't dream of not moisturising your face and moisturising your body. So you should be moisturising that vagina, you know, at least, at least, you know, at least three times a week, but daily, you know, get that moisture in. And then um, really important to work on your pelvic floor as well. And that's all part of genital urinary syndrome of menopause. And a, a woman's gynae physio is worth their weight in gold. They Absolutely. are, they? Really they're cool. probably the most underrated people around, really, aren't they? Because hard to find. Um, nobody really knows what they do, but they can work miracles. <laughs> They can work absolute miracles. So I, I just bang on about women's health, gynae physios. Um, and uh, because part of genital urinary syndrome of menopause is that kind of prolapse, a weak pelvic floor, urinary frequency. You know, it's all it's all related. That's why they changed, changed the name really from vaginal dryness to genital urinary syndrome of menopause, uh, recurrent urine infection. So, you know, do your Kegels exercises, but it, it's quite difficult to know how to do them properly. Yes. Um, yeah, you can get these kind of products that you can get from Boots where you kind of stick it in your vagina and it, and then it tells you if you're, I think you can attach them to apps. Now, I am a, an absolute IT deficient nightmare, so I wouldn't have a clue how to work it myself. But I know you can get these products. You attach to an app and it tells you if you're squeezing hard enough. Um, but actually, I think if you can get access to a pelvic floor physio, they will examine you diagnose you and show you exactly how to do it but you know once you've done that then you've got your moisture in your lube in for sex then it's your vaginal estrogens is probably your first line treatment and there's all sorts you can get you can get creams now I personally find the creams and um, there's one called Avestin um, it was designed to put into your vagina but actually I think it's better on the labia Mm. And again, that's why it's so important to know when the woman's talking about her sore, itchy flower, 
you need to know because <laughs> there's no point in putting something on somewhere where it's not a problem. You need to know exactly where the problem is. So I'm lucky in my clinic that I, I, you know, for most of my clinic, it's face to face. So I can examine the women. Um, but I know more and more GPs and more and more consultations is, uh, doing it over the phone um, needs must. But I think at some point the women needs to be examined because you need to rule it out things like lichen sclerosis, which is a kind of inflammatory disorder of the labia where the labia really kind of resorb and that's treated entirely differently. So you, you want to make sure there's nothing else going on. So you just need to have a look. Um, but so, yeah, you can use a vest and cream for the labia and then you can use there's various things. I mean, there's Vagifem pessaries that you can put inside your vagina. I have to admit, I'm not a huge fan of them because they come with a kind of long, hard plastic applicator. And if you've got a dry vagina sticking up a hard plastic applicator into your vagina is not the most comfortable thing to use. A lot of women love them and they do work. You base a tiny, tiny wee tablet, stick it on the top and kind of fire it in. Um, but the especially if you've got a lot of dryness there, it, it can be hard for that kind of dry tablet to, to melt. My hair, touch, I think a lot of people say that you, because, because you've got this long applicator, you're thinking you've got to put it all the way up. No, you don't. Yeah, just it just up. Up. In, a, in a little way, doesn't it? Yeah. So I, mean, I think we've got a lot of people who are using it way too far up with the giant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but I still think if you're really dry and sore and you've got a lot of kind of micro trauma there, a lot of kind of, because when you look at a woman's vagina with genital urinary syndrome of menopause, it can look really pale and fragile. You can also get these kind of red and flamed bleeding areas. So just the tiniest amount of trauma can, you know, start make you really uncomfortable and bleed. So that's my problem with Vagifemin. Other specialists love it. I, I'm just personally not a fan. It's maybe because I mainly deal with breast cancer patients, so I'm seeing more dry vaginas than probably most. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I love Invagis, which is what I call my waxy bullet of goodness. And it is literally just a wee waxy bullet and you just pop it in yourself. So just gently pop it in and it melts in the vagina. So it's lovely and moisturizing melting. You do have to warn women that you might get a wee bit of a discharge just from the bullet melting, essentially, but it's ultra low dose um, and, you know, it can be used, um, well, you, you can use what we call a loading dose where you put it in every night for three weeks and then two to three times a week thereafter. Um, and it's just great. And you can also get gel. So there's Blissel gel, which is another one um, great for a really, really dry vagina can be a wee bit messy. Um, I've personally tried, well, I think, you know, you can't be prescribing these products if you've not tried them yourself. So I, I you know, <laughs> try them all myself. I, I, I must admit found with the whistle, um, it was a wee bit kind of wet and messy and you tended to get a wee bit of a soggy gusset and nobody really wants a soggy gusset, but, but actually it is, <laughs> but it's great for that really, really dry sore vagina. Absolutely. I have a question here from Pauline who's saying she's using a Vesta now. So does the does the app applicator only have to go a little way in as well with that one or the full length? Yeah, no, no, just a wee way in. Just a wee way in. Um, I find that, as I say, the Vesta is better for the labia. You, I mean, it, it was made to be put inside the vagina, but I just find it's a wee bit messy. But, but again, it's personal preference. Every woman's different and that's what makes us so unique and so wonderful. So what works for one woman it is entirely different for someone else. So I think yeah, you just I try I them. I not tolerate the veggie fem at all. It actually, it just felt like it was burning. I think I lasted yeah. three days. But the Avestum is absolutely fine. The thing I'm loving is the E-string. E-string. E-string's fabulous as well. I love an E-string. Um, and it's actually great for older women that don't have that dexterity to, you know, to work the Vagifem or, um, or the, like, the Blissel applicators or anything. And what I generally do is I put it in, initially for them and then I show them how to change it um uh, and uh, but most women are absolutely fine they can change it themselves I mean literally there's nowhere else for it to go you bung it up there it's not going to go anywhere else so you just bung it up and it lasts for three months and it's wonderful true <laughs> I have a couple of, couple of in, in. I did have to get my husband to take one out and I did have to get the GP to take one out because <laughs> Long story with lots of bleeding because of changing the marina coil into the you, you, you when it's slippery with blood, you can't get it. Yes, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> sometimes it can, yeah. You just have to, it's a wee bit difficult to get your finger around it, but yeah. um, 
I think I might invent some sort of little nice sort of soft rubbery little hook thing that you can get there. You go. Some people <laughs> apparently have <laughs> dental floss around it, which I don't think is that much. If you put minted dental floss, that would not be comfortable. I, 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 I'm not, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> Yeah, a bit. Very true. Um, other ones are sort of um, intra rosa. Um, I actually am a big of fan of intra rosa, um, especially because I'm seeing a lot of women who with breast cancer that are on um, aromatase inhibitors and have been told um, estrogen is the root of all evil and must never go anywhere near it ever again. Um, intra rosa is what they call DHE pessary, so it converts to estrogen and kind of androgen testosterone like products it's actually fabulous for you know it's great for that kind of vaginal atrophy it really plumps up the vaginal tissues but it also improves sexual function um and if you're on aromatase inhibitor it's not going to aromatize to estrogen so there are some studies i mean they're, they're kind of ones with low numbers but i've, I've shown that it doesn't increase serum estrogen levels whatsoever so i'm using that more and more in women that are on, on aromatase inhibitors uh, we need to give them something um and there's ospenaphine which is the the um new tablet on the block um used that a few times you can't use it in women with active breast cancer but if you don't have active breast cancer or, or active hormonal related cancer then and if you're not getting anywhere with any of the creams or the pessaries or the gels or the rings or the interosa um try ospenaphine yeah all right let us move then on to the cancer because this is an interesting thing so there, there are various different types of cancer. There are cancers that are hormone responsive and ones that aren't. Yeah. If you've had one that is not a hormone responsive cancer, are you all right to use all of the things that you've just mentioned? Yes. If you've got a, so like an ER negative, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, breast cancer, um, your triple negative breast cancers, or indeed pelvic cancers that are, you know, some, are, some aren't even hormone dependent at all. But if you've um, got a cancer that's not hormone dependent, yep, um, you're absolutely fine with all those treatments that we discussed. Yeah. All right. Hang on. Just, got, just let me take you back. There's a couple of questions here. A lady saying she's allergic to Avestin. Um, can she use another... I mean, it could be the the is there is there something that's similar to a vest and that's a cream as well or would her only choice really if she wanted to stick with something like that be blissel for the extra probably try the blissel yeah sometimes yeah. it's not actual what's in it it's it's the base of it and some of mm. them have you know some kind of glycerine in it or other products in it that would be nice if they didn't have it but it's yeah it's the base of it that they're usually allergic to yeah so it's something and else Another lady here is saying that she loves her e-string as well um, and it's made a real difference, but she has to take it out when she uses a period moon cup. Um, would she have to? I mean, are, is, this, is this a problem of not enough vertical space um, or could she flip them around and put the cup higher and put the, the ring below it? I mean, you wouldn't have to take it out. I think it's probably maybe if you're kind of dragging a, a kind of a suction problem and so I, I think it may, if you have an e-string in, maybe your cup wouldn't work so well. I mean, I, I think it's probably trial and error. I've heard women that, that keep them in with their moon cups. Um, other women take, take it out. Some women have sex with the e-string in. Some women take it out. It, it, there's no hard or fast rules. It's whatever works for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess so if you are taking that and you're having a period for a week or so, then you'd probably want to use an investment or something in between, but it wouldn't yeah. use you're keeping yeah. yourself well estrogenized um yeah have a, have a couple of things you know so use your e-string but yeah have some yeah ovestin or blissel and standby yeah there are estriol creams which um and, and ovestin is there seem to be others that you can buy online i'm just looking at this question you have, have you, and just called estriol cream um if people buy that online is that the same sort of so it's the strength. I think you um, so you, like you can get um, Gina over the counter now, which is the ten microgram. So it's the equivalent of Vagifem, um, and you can get zero point zero one percent estrile, or you can get zero point one percent estrile. So it's the strength of cream, um, and again, it's it's trial and error. Sometimes the lowest dose will work for you. Other times you have to to up the dose. Yeah. All right. Back to the breast cancer people. Um, I think what happens with a lot of, you know, 
you know, touching wood here, I have not had breast cancer so far. Um, but I, for a lot of us, when we, when we, you know, we, there's a lot of focus on the acute phase, you know, and we watch people going through horrendous chemo and things like that. And we don't then realise that those who do have a hormone respondent breast cancer then have to spend five to 10 years taking various medications that wreak absolute havoc on their pelvic floor. So what are the medications and what do they do? So so when a woman first gets diagnosed, so you're, you're literally chucking a whole load of, of information at these women and they're understandably not taking it on board and they are treated with a whole team of oncologists and radiotherapists and surgeons but as soon as you're out that end so you've had your surgery your chemotherapy your radiotherapy you essentially are often just discharged for for a yearly mammogram but the what causes the havoc well what can often cause and we're talking breast cancer here because there's gynae cancers that get treated differently but with breast cancer often chemotherapy will put women into chemical menopause and sometimes that's just temporarily and sometimes it's permanent so if you're younger it's often just temporary if you're older it's often permanent um and so you'll be put into menopause then which then obviously plummets your estrogen levels and dries everything out down below um and is causing the havoc and then if you have a hormone receptor positive breast cancer then depending if you're premenopausal or postmenopausal will use medications so some women will be given tamoxifen which is what we call a selective estrogen receptor modulator and so what it that it does blocks is, estrogen from coming into into a cell yeah blocks estrogen in the boobs um it stimulates it in the womb which is why you often can get uh you know very very low risk but there is a risk of kind of endometrial hyperplasia which is abnormal linings of, of the womb or, or even womb cancer rarely it also stimulates it in the vagina so you often won't get that absolute vaginal dryness with tamoxifen and sometimes you can just get this weird type of discharge sometimes watery discharge but women often still can get that vaginal dryness with it but you'll still again get that genital urinary syndrome of the menopause but the one that does the the most carnage so to speak is the aromatase inhibitors and what they do is that um if you um if you're premenopausal, your estrogen's up here. And then if you're postmenopausal, naturally, your estrogen is here. But you still have some tissues in the body, like fat tissue producing estrogen. So if you're on aromatase inhibitor, it literally plummets it into your boots. So I'm actually producing estrogen, yeah? Yeah, it plummets it. So I, I say to my ladies, it's your, your estrogen's like a 100-year-old lady estrogen level. And that's what causes the carnage because the body and especially the vagina and the pelvic floor, it's, it's filled full of estrogen receptors. You need estrogen for a healthy pelvic floor, healthy bladder, healthy urethra, healthy vagina, healthy sex, you know, sex. Um, sex drive and so basically um, you need estrogen and so we're plummeting it so it's thought to be a good thing with regards to reducing risk of breast cancer recurrence which is why we do it so it's working how we're wanting it to work but it is giving us negligible estrogen levels so these women um, very quickly get a lot of vaginal dryness irritability burning itching um, can't have sex with their partners way too sore can't sit down can't ride their bike can't go on their peloton um you know itching all day can't get through a meeting at work because they have to get up and use the loo every you know half an hour um so it causes devastation and in the old days when we used to do breast cancer clinic returns the, the women would come in, would examine their breasts, send them for a mammogram, say, okay, are you still taking your medication? Okay, that's great, cheerio. Um, we all did it. We had about 40 patients to get through in one afternoon. It was a conveyor belt. It wasn't great. And, and it, you know, we never actually said to them, how are you really getting on? And now I am obsessed and my colleagues will tell you how obsessed I am about asking every woman about their vaginal dryness. But I'll usually say to them, how are you getting on with your letrozole or anastrozole or XMSD? And so they are your aromatase inhibitors. How are you getting on? And invariably they'll say, fine. And then I'll say, how are you really getting on? 
And then that's when they open up. And most, I would say about 90% of those women just look relieved and then open up because they, you, you've given them permission to talk about their their symptoms because nobody's asked them before because nobody asks these women. And Do you think uh, there's also a sense of, um, of you know, I, I had a friend who had melanoma on her leg to, to take that out, they had to take a number of lymph nodes. And from then on, you know, she had one giant elephant leg. And nobody warned her that this was going to happen. Um, and But in the end, you know, the, the, the attitude she got was, well, you're alive. You know, what what's your problem? Do you think that there's a sort of attitude in many ways that, you know, women have got to feel grateful for, for the fact that they've lived through the cancer and now anything else is just, a, you know, a, something that they have to put up with because they've survived the worst thing? Yeah, I mean, I think so many women feel that way. I'm not sure whether anyone deliberately makes them feel that way but they they I think a huge majority of them feel that way just feel lucky to be alive and every day women say to me well I thought that that was just my lot I thought that this is how life is meant to be there are women in their early 40s who think that okay they will never have sex again and their relationship is broken up and that is just their lot and they should be happy to feel alive and that's tragic it's heartbreaking mm -hmm. and the simplest things that we can do to that can significantly turn their lives around so we should be asking every single patient at every single opportunity about their genital urinary syndrome of menopause and the other thing is that with aromatase inhibitors the two biggest side effects are joint pains and their genital urinary syndrome menopause and we actually we know that women actually don't comply with these treatments very well by about six months the compliance have dro has dropped off a cliff. So we are thinking and the surgeons are thinking they're kind of toddling along quite happily taking their medications but they're not. And we're so obsessed about saying to these women, you can't have estrogen or like you can't have vaginal estrogen, that we're missing the point that the women stopped her and, you know, letrozole or XMSD in six months ago anyway. So she's not getting any reduced recurrence of her breast cancer because she stopped it because she can't tolerate her symptoms. But nobody's asking these women. We must get better at asking them. Yeah. And not only that, I mean, I guess if you isn't not just the vaginal dryness but the bladder issues as well they're not going to get better unless somebody no. talks up about them they're just going to get, get worse yeah. or at least stay the same or get worse it's not it's not like they're going to miraculously re recover so and, I think that's normal that, and they've given up their jobs because they couldn't sit through a meeting they couldn't sit through an hour-long meeting or they couldn't commute their hour to work yeah it's, it's crazy isn't it so if we've got somebody then sitting in front of us let's start with the immediate things that they can do and we'll move on to whether or whether or not they can or can't have vaginal estrogen in a moment um so what are some of the the easy things that are that are very low risk that can be done that would help people in this situation so again start off with a good vaginal moisturizer like yes and then if you can have sex and want to have sex your vaginal lubricant um, and always remember about the oil based is no, you know, no condoms of the oil base. So it's basically your vaginal lubricant, vaginal moisturizer. Um, I, I kind of like coconut oil. I know there's a wee bit of debate about coconut oil. It's cheap. And I think as long as you go for the pure coconut oil, organic, and again, make sure you're not using it with condoms, but it, it, it's cheap. And a lot of women do actually struggle getting yes prescribed for them. Um, and I work in quite a deprived area. And if they can't get yes, then at least get some coconut oil onto. And they can massage it into the labia um, and really just do some very gentle labial stretches. So for that, it, 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 it's great. Um, and as I say, I know there is some debate. Some people don't like it. I'm a fan. I, I like it. Um, so, so it's that, getting the moisturiser in. Again, referring them to pelvic floor physio. Um, cannot emphasise that enough. And then um, talking to them about vaginal estrogen and it's not true that women on aromatase inhibitors cannot have vaginal estrogen it's a discussion um and we need to be allowing these women to have a discussion and and be able to make their own decision so the the point and the worry about vaginal estrogen is you're using an aromatase inhibitor to plummet your estrogen to you know negligible levels and then the thinking is if you then give vaginal estrogen that kind of seems to counteract the whole point of plummeting your estrogen. But actually, we know with vaginal estrogen, after three months, when you if you check levels after three months, those levels are negligible. 
And if you're really, really dry and fragile and have got a lot of micro trauma down below, when you initially use it, and I always warn people, look, when you initially use this, you might have a wee bit of stinging. And if you, and it's not actually recommended to check levels um, when you're giving estrogen uh, because the levels are so low anyway. But if you did check the level maybe after a month, it might have gone up temporarily, but by three months, it's gone back down. So there actually is no reason why we shouldn't be using vaginal estrogen because these women were causing carnage to their lives. And I, I say to all my colleagues, these women are not just a set of boobs. We cannot just treat boobs and be so focused on, on breast recurrence risk. We have to treat this woman as a, a whole as a person. And this this sums it up for you, actually. This is Shirley saying, I'm not ashamed to say that I was at, in that mindset. She, the comment before was, you know, that she wouldn't be surprised if GSM contributed to, to a suicide. She's yeah. saying, I was lying on the floor sobbing, begging, begging the doctor to help me with constant pain. This actually almost makes me want to cry. Um, painful, debilitating UTIs that she was experiencing. I mean, just, you know, to live with that day by day is, is just, it's, you know, well, virtually impossible. We, we think nothing of prescribing buckets full of antibiotics over the phone for urine infections. And one of the biggest reasons for people to end up in hospital with acute kidney injury or you know problems that, that need admission to hospital is, is kidney injury down to antibiotics. And th that apparently seems to be fine, but we are obsessing about tiny doses of estrogen. I think we've lost all perspective completely and you know as you say I, it's not unusual to see women who are suicidal I mean I, I did a just a normal follow-up clinic it wasn't my menopause clinic it was just a normal follow-up clinic a couple of weeks ago my first woman was suicidal um, second woman hunted sex with her partner for for near enough 10 years and my third woman was at, at her marriage had broken up and my fourth woman had left her job um, and that was four women in a row in a normal follow-up clinic always significant GSM symptoms that nobody had asked them they weren't on any treatment I think some of them had tried to get some treatment from their GP and and I completely understand that GPs feel cautious about it and I think that giving vaginal estrogen to aromatase inhibitor patients is not um, I wouldn't expect a GP to do that. It's not, a, you know, they've only got 10 minutes. It's not a 10 minute discussion. So absolutely, you know, it's not their fault. But I, I, I just wish that more women had access to a menopause specialist that can has the time to sit and go through all the pros and the cons. But we know actually with... Um, so what I tend to do with my ladies on um, aromatase inhibitors, I tend to use Invagis because it's ultra low dose estriol pessary. One year's worth of vaginal estrogen is the equivalent of one milligram, so one tablet of oral HRT. You're going to get more estrogen from your belly fat. Um, so, you know, there and there's no sustained absorption. So as I say, if you I think people get really, really obsessed about trying to measure sedum levels. And then I think some women get the advice is to use it very, very short term and stop and start and stop and start. So take it for a few weeks till they feel better and then stop it. But if you stop it, all your symptoms come back. Oh, and actually, if you stop, start, stop, start, that's when you're going to get your levels. So you you'll have to repeat that loading dose again every time. Yes. Right? Uh -huh. So keep using it. If you keep using it, by three months, your levels have come back down to negligible levels and you just keep going with it twice a week. And if you use something that's ultra low dose, so, you know, something like Invagis, um, ultra low dose or Blissel, they're my two kind of go to ones for my ladies on aromatase inhibitors or Prasterone. And Prasterone, as I say, uh, um, if they're on aromatase inhibitor, it's not going to change to estrogen and all the research has shown that it doesn't increase your estrogen levels whatsoever and also the, the it's shown that you get a lot of um, improved sexual functioning with it as well yeah it's an interesting one because i'm in my spare time um i think i was mentioning this to you before i i rewrite um 
continuing professional development material from Australia to make it sound slightly more interesting. So GPs will either listen to the podcast or read the article. Um, and one of them was an interview the other day with Sue Davis um, and a man called Professor John Eden, who's a, a gynecologist in Australia as well. And he was saying he's quite, if someone's on an aromatase inhibitor, and, you know, basically the survival rate now for breast cancer is around about 90% of women are living 20 years or more. Um, and he said it made him actually really quite, and I quote, quite cranky to not give them um, testosterone or a DHEA or something like that if you're on an aromatase inhibitor because you're basically saying to this woman for the rest of her life, you can't have sex. And that's yeah. just fair. Yeah, I mean, you essentially are. I mean, it, and it really frustrates me when I hear oncologists saying, well, these medications are really well tolerated. They're not. You're just not answer, asking the right question. Uh, I've, I've yet to meet many women on aromatase inhibitors who are tolerating them with no problems. I think they just, the ones that are tolerating them, they've just not been asked <laughs> what symptoms are you actually having. Yeah. Um, and we also were assuming that elderly women aren't having sex as well I mean I saw an 85 year old in clinic the other day and and she said to me she'd not had sex with her husband for you know and I and again she, nobody had asked her about vaginal dryness because she's in her 80s so she everyone assumed she's not having sex she's probably having way more sex than the rest of us that are in the sandwich generation you know we're looking after feral children and elderly parents you know the last thing we want to do is have sex half the time but she's free you know she's quite happily yeah you know, uh, act with her husband, so she should be. Um, but she's really, right she was in her eighties, and she was telling me she's her, her, you know, the, her original husband died, and she's now sort of found herself a new lover. And, she's, and the sex is fantastic. I'm looking like, you can't say this to me. You're my best friend's mother. <laughs> really too much information. The, oh, that's uh, wonderful. Yeah, and she called it her playpen. So this was her playpen. She said her playpen was very dry. And I was like, I need to know what you mean by your playpen. <laughs> and uh, so, but yeah, so we're we're not asking the questions and we can't just assume just because you're 70 or 80 you're not having sex so she was chuffed to bits when I gave her some vaginal estrogen because and then she kind of ran out of the room and, and uh, kind of shouted to her husband and she was deaf as a post as well so she didn't realize she was shouting down the, the corridor uh, in front of all the patients that they were going to have sex in a few days <laughs> <laughs> but God love her and, and yeah I'll see if when she comes back or she <laughs> I hope they gave her a standing ovation as she left <laughs> The, um, is there if, if you if you've got somebody like this if you've got somebody on aromatase inhibitors or, or whatever are there any tools that you can use that you know would help them balance out the sort of risk benefit ratio I guess so um I mean we use tools like predict breast to look at benefits of endocrine treatment so that's not really, I mean, it's looking at, okay, how much benefit are you getting from your tamoxifen or your um, letrozole or your aromatase inhibitor? So, and it will tell you, you know, you're getting a, a kind of 1% benefit or a 5% benefit. And, you know, percentages are different for every person. A 1% benefit can be a huge benefit to one person and nothing to someone else. But it doesn't mean that everybody's getting 1%. What it means that for is for every 100 women one person's getting a benefit and we don't know who's getting that benefit and we don't know really how much benefit but yeah if somebody's having really really um significant problems with their medication then then you can go on to things like predict breast and look to see how much benefit what i often use in my clinic is i'll give medication holidays um and a holiday actually sounds quite a nice thing doesn't it you're off and you're you know but uh, what all this just means is that you're having a kind of six to eight week break from your medication and it's really useful to see okay are your symptoms down to simply just being postmenopausal or perimenopausal or are they down to your medication or a bit of both and then you can tailor your treatment depending on you know if you've given them a six week holiday eight week holiday and everything's way way better then you can say okay it looks like most of your symptoms were down to that aromatase inhibitor and as long as you don't have any contraindications let's switch you to tamoxifen you know, sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not. But I, I do those medication holidays all the time. And so I use Predict Breast to help with that because a lot of women are terrified about 
being off their medication for for six to eight weeks. But, you know, nothing's going to happen that six to eight weeks. Breast cancers are so slow growing for the vast majority of them that, you know, your breast cancer is not going to suddenly spring back into action over six to eight weeks. Um, But giving that holiday can make all the difference. And actually, the other thing you can do um, for some women that it's not appropriate to switch to tamoxifen, you can, well, you can switch to other aromatase inhibitors. They all, although they're all aromatase inhibitors, they all have slightly different side effects and are tolerated in different ways. But the other thing you can do, actually, is keep going with it for as long as possible. Then you think, okay, I, I really can't tolerate this anymore. So then have a break. And then we start it maybe after two to three months and then have a break. Now, there's there's actually not that much evidence to show that that is any less effective than taking it all the time. Um, oh. And I seem to think at the top of my head, I can't remember which trial it was, but the, the Aussies did, did uh, had a look at that to see if there was any difference. And there didn't seem to be any difference in, in um, efficiency for that. And literally getting back to basics as well, when you've got a woman in front of you that's got all this vaginal symptoms, it's just so important to know what she's washing with. A lot of them are are just obsessed with, you know, how the vagina smells, especially with the younger, you know, we're seeing so many young girls with breast cancer now, and we're giving them this horrible combination called Zolodex Eczemestine or Zolodex, which basically is a injection that turns their ovaries off. And then we use the aromatase inhibitor to, again, plummet their estrogen to negligible levels, causes havoc with their with the vagina, sex drive, everything. And it often gives them this kind of unusual discharge. Um, and then they get really obsessed with the smell of the discharge because there's, you know, the Kardashians telling you your vagina needs to smell of, of pineapples. I, I have no words for that one. But, so they're using all these vaginal washes, thinking you know, your vagina needs to smell of a tropical coconut and you know it's it's or some pressure from their partner that they might have a different odor down there um so it's just getting back to basics you just need to use water to wash your vagina with it's it's like a self-cleaning oven and and then you can use your moisturizers on your labia but getting back to basics like that I've seen some you know horrendous I mean I saw this poor girl the other day she was mid- 30s and it literally was carnage down there unfortunately I had a mask on because normally I've got a very good poker face but even I was quite shocked um a poor thing um you know she had a vagina of an 80 year old but it was because she'd been using all these awful washes that you buy over the supermarket mm-hmm. and and um you know just, so, you, so this wasn't because of the cancer or anything like that it's literally because of the products that she was putting on there that it actually well, probably, had, both. Probably, was, probably both but the right. products were making it 10 times worse so she thought she was doing the right thing i mean i just i can't stand the term vaginal douching um or you know whatever steaming that's even worse or <laughs> i don't know is someone's doing ozone treatment is <laughs> I think she was pulling that up a bum, but <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, all this stuff on on uh, you know, they see celebrities doing this and think that, or their partners are pressurizing them into having a vagina that smells like coconuts or whatever, you know. And so I think in their best efforts, they can often make things ten times worse. So I th- for it's really important to get back to basics and say, okay, look, what you're washing with, what you're using as a moisturizer. And, and get the basics right first. Yeah, yeah. Question here from Shirley. Um, is testosterone an option to help with libido and clitoral shrinkage during the use of estrogen blockers? Yeah, so if I you're... you're too. Yeah, I mean, uh, in fact, I started a lady today on testosterone on her aromatase inhibitor. She had a really low libido, um, brain fog. Um, so the British Menopause Society recommends it or says we can use it for distressing low libido. But we know antidotally it's great for brain fog. Um, uh, You know, it's an important hormone for heart, bone, um, brain health. So um, the concern with testosterone is that it can aromatize to estrogen. And so in the old days, women were told they could never have testosterone if you have any type of cancer at all or any or breast, sorry, breast cancer at all or any type of treatment. But but if you're an aromatase inhibitor, it's going to stop your testosterone aromatizes to, to estrogen. So there's no reason why you can't have it. Okay. Unfortunately, with everything in women's health, the trials haven't been done, have they? 
Well, this is the difficulty, isn't it? Yeah, knowing because if there's so little study on all of this, yeah. and I think this is the Ember Sue Davis's point, but it's sort of like, you know, I've got no particular objection to this, but but if you know, if you are going to start a patient on these, then you know, make sure it's a team, you know, you're in that the oncology oncologist is happy, that that everybody's sort of happy with it. But I guess the other side of this is then is let's say it's me, where does my choice come in? If, every, if everybody else says no and I go, well, hang on a second, this is my quality of life and my life's really there, I'm on the floor begging in tears and I'm suicidal, when does my choice trump somebody else's um, decision for me? Well, it absolutely should. I mean, the whole, the, the um, NICE and the General Medical um, Council are very clear on everything should be a shared decision, so this shared decision-making. So... And again, this is why it's very difficult for GPs, because you can't really have a, a long shared decision making in 10 minutes. It just doesn't work. So you, this is why I think every woman needs access to a menopause specialist. So you can have this long discussion, because if a woman um, is wanting testosterone, she's on aromatase inhibitor, I'm going to talk to her and say, look, okay, Theoretically, it's not going to, to aromatize to estrogen, so it should be absolutely fine. There's no evidence to show that it that it does increase the risk of breast cancer, but we don't have any evidence to show that it's safe either. But just lack of evidence is not no evidence. Yes, yes. It's the investment hasn't been done, and I don't think it ever will be, unfortunately. And so we're having to kind of look at kind of retrospectively what happens when we give women all these products whether it be HRT or testosterone in, in breast cancer and it's it's not the best but it's it's all we have and I think it's all we're going to have but but so it is a shared decision making and and I even prescribe and it's and it's not a, a quick consultation but I even prescribe women who have had an ER positive breast cancer I sometimes give them HRT because their quality of life is so awful and they'll say to me I feel suicidal or you know we're so focused on breast cancer recurrence but we need to remember that you know these women are not dying of the breast cancer they're dying of heart disease or osteoporosis or dementia or you know they're living years and years and years with their breast cancer you know diagnosis and their and their symptoms because of our treatment so we have to we cannot treat them we have to treat the totality of the women and treat them holistically and we're assuming that women are just purely focused on breast cancer recurrence but actually that's not true at all most women are focused on their quality of life and you've got to ask them and you know some women are terrified of it coming back and, and they will say to me I will never you know even have vaginal estrogen they're terrified of it but actually the vast majority are like no you've explained things to me you've gone over the evidence gone over the trials this is what I want to do and I, and I am aware that there is you know conflicting evidence about increased risks of localized recurrence but my quality of life is the most important thing to me so I want to take this and I and you know we shouldn't we shouldn't be saying to these women well I don't care what you want this is what you you know this is what you can have and most oncologists are not menopause trained and most breast surgeons are not menopause trained so the problem is that if you go to the oncologist or the breast surgeons they may say no just because of the kind of hangover effect of the WHI trials or whatever and they're you know I work in a um a speciality where estrogen is seen as the root of all evil and it's not and we just need to be comfortable with basically working with the lack of evidence but putting the women at the center of what we're doing yeah i guess from the oncologist's point of view you know they're probably thinking well you know you might be really well menopause trained I'm really well cancer trained and, you know, what I know of the evidence means that I would be putting my patient at risk. So, but he, so I guess it's then somehow, you know, managing to bring the two together and, and yeah. as you say, putting the patient at the centre of it because really in the end it would have to be our decision. But I guess there's one worry that a lot of people would have too is that, they, you know, the message of, is then that, you know, well, HRT is safe for everybody then, but if you don't go through those sort of risk benefit tools then you you might actually be putting somebody at risk yeah I mean it's not for everybody and it, it is an individual discussion for every single woman whether they've had cancer or not but specifically for women who have had hormone receptor positive cancer or even triple negative cancer it is and I you know my consultations last for an hour I 
uh, you know, I have 40 to an hour long appointments and often I will go well beyond that because it's not a, fa a quick, you know, consultation. So again, that's why we shouldn't be expecting our GPs to be able to handle this in 10 minutes. It's, it's you can't do it. Yeah, it's a shame we haven't got to the point now where we could actually got, you know, drugs that are good enough for actually saying we can just block it in this particular spot yeah. and the rest of the body continues on as normal. That would be lovely. That would make that would be amazing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If only. <laughs> yeah. What if you could actually do that with some type of injectable aromatase inhibitor to just act locally, like a local estrogen acting on a breast? If you have one that you could just have that was, you know, implanted or something around the breast tissue. So it was, um, anyway, I digress into some world of imaginary medicine. <laughs> Yes, I get quite excited about thinking about things that, um, that don't exist. Um, are there other things that we should be considering about here? I'm just sort of having a look at my um, at my double pages of notes here. Um, so lasers, lasers are becoming, um, you know, the carbon uh, dioxide lasers, and that has to be done in the right hands. Um, and there's, you know, there's some conflicting evidence, but... Um, you know, Paula Briggs, who's the chair of the BMS, she, I know she's a big fan of lasers. Um, what they do is they kind of cause some kind of tiny, tiny wee trauma to the vaginal tissues and then encourage them to regrow and the collagen to regrow and to get that kind of vaginal mic to kind of get it back to premenopausal levels. But you have to know what you're doing. Um, there, it's not available in general under the NHS. There, I think there's a couple of units. There's one in London, an NHS breast unit in London, and I believe it's either Manchester or Birmingham Women's Hospital, I can't remember which one, are doing trials on uh, under the NHS in it. But most of the time it's, it's available privately. But you have to go to um, somebody who knows what they're doing and not your kind of hairdresser down the road. <laughs> you disappoint me because um, <laughs> yes now you can you know, these, these are the th things we just no do not do this do not buy these things you can buy them for home use i know just, <laughs> no, seriously do not these things to heat tissue up to 42 degrees um there's an electric there's one that uses an, ele an electric current it's a plasma plasma one there's a radio frequency one you can use at home and there is a um I don't think that's an LED, a new LED light one. Um, and you know, 42 degrees, you can burn yourself quite badly. And it, it, to get a benefit as well, you need, you know, a certain amount. So I'm prattling on about this because I, I fronted a, a conference a couple of weeks back on a, literally talking about the regulations that should come into this industry because it should only be done in the hands of a medical practitioner. It really does depend on patient selection. It's not going to yeah, help with a great prolapse. It's not going to help somebody whose bladder le is leaking all over the place. Um, so, and it needs to be, you know, 42 degrees can do you some significant work. I just literally, I want to cross and uncross my legs at the yep. moment we're talking about it. It brings yep. tears to the eyes, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Shirley's saying here, laser therapy won't hurt, won't hurt vo help vulval symptoms. I will beg to differ here, and I will say I'll tell you why. Because um, I've been, I, I was a model for a treatment at uh, at one of these things. They were short of vagina on a training day, so they said, "Would you like one?" And I thought, oh, "Okay, why not?" Um, and then I had a radio, radio frequency treatment uh, on the external genitalia and internally. And I can say honestly, from the radio frequency one, that it was the first time in a number of years, despite the Avestan and and um, you know everything else for the last few years that I walked home without thinking where's my labia positioned and having to stop behind a tree and rearrange myself. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah I mean, halfway home and I literally thought, oh my god, I haven't thought about my labia. <laughs> this, is a, this is a miracle, um, and it's been pretty good since then. So it, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it has promising results to help to help with um, labial symptoms. I think it's really important that you know estrogen or Prasterone or, um, you know, that ospemaphine is not for everybody. I think the more options that we have, the better, because we need we need options, don't we? We do. We need, yeah, we do. The shame about them, though, is, of course, you know, they're massively expensive. You've also got to have, you know, very, very deep pockets to be able to afford them. You're talking, you know, £3,000 or something to have a course of three treatments of these things, and that's a lot of money. Yeah, yes. I mean... Yeah, hugely, hugely. And, and, and we need to remember that a lot of these women are, are, you know, have lost their jobs or are not are not being able to work full time because of their symptoms. So it's, you know, it's so prohibitively expensive. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So apart from those kinds of things, are there any other sort of novelty type treatments that are some people swear by PRP, platelet rich plasma? Yeah, I, I have to hold up my hands. I really don't know much about that. Um, yeah. yeah, it's an interesting one. They call it the O shot. They um, yes, uh -huh. yeah. Inside yeah. the uh, inject inside the front wall of the vagina and into the labia and even into the clitoris. Now that'll make your legs cross. Um, <laughs> it's not huge in Glasgow, so that's <laughs> not huge for Scottish women. So yeah, I, I hold up my hands. Don't know much about that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I that one nobody has given me. Um, but I have actually. I've been to the training days on it, and um, and I know some people say that they get. The, for lichen sclerosis, apparently they get some quite good mm -hmm. um, results on that with a, with an improvement in symptoms. But again, you know there are no studies, um, so this is just basically you know what doctors are saying. The, the patients are coming back and saying to them, um, and that it can make a, a reasonable. I mean, it kind of makes sense. You're in, you're in, you're injecting growth factors and and stem cells into into an area which, in theory, should help with with blood supply and help with the um the collagenesis as well so it sort of makes yeah. sense like I mean, the other thing, what's really important as well is what we're talking about um, improving blood supply. So you want to be making sure, you know, saying to the women, you know, try and reduce your smoking because obviously smoking is going to reduce the oxygen, the blood supply down there. But, you know, like masturbation, um, you know, you want to be, you know, increasing that blood supply to the clitoris, to the labia. So you can use these tiny, tiny wee bullet vibrators, uh, you know, really, really gently, but you, anything to to improve the circulation of those tissues down there yeah absolutely another thing is supplements what about things like omega-7 and stuff like that have been shown to sort of help with mucosal dryness are mm -hmm. they worth giving a go to um, I think that was well, so certain supplements you need to be careful of if you're on something like tamoxifen. Um, so you need to be, you know, staying away from um, things like uh, starflower oil, evening primrose oil, that sort of thing, if you're on tamoxifen. So a lot of things can interact. Usually with aromatase inhibitors, you're fairly okay. And so it's worth a try. Um, I think the problem is, as I say, yeah, lack of evidence, but you're, you're not going to get, you know, lots of evidence with these supplements. Um and there, a lot of them are not regulated. You have no idea how much is in. So one supplement might have a thousand milligrams of your omega, and another supplement might have, you know, much smaller amounts. So it, it's difficult. I, I, I am a big fan of, uh, well, try something, see if it works. Um, just always caution with tamoxifen because a lot of things can interact with it. Yeah. Question here from Jules asking, if you can't do any of that because you just can't touch it because the skin is splitting on the labia so badly, um, is this when we just like pull it right back and just get it down to just use the Avestin or something like that? Can you use Avestin? This is actually a question I got the other day. Can you use Avestin on cracked and bleeding skin? Is that okay or does it have to be healed before you put it on? Obviously, if you like Jules, the chances of it being healed are pretty slim. Um, yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's difficult to say to a woman, okay, you need to wait for your skins to heal because it's uh, some women they're not going to heal um and you know i say to them look okay just got to go really really gently again getting back to basics what are you washing with okay maybe just start then with using something like hydromol emollient to try and just heal it a wee bit um but you know it's all that else saying we well, shouldn't use these things on on cracked skin but if you're never going to get non-cracked skin then give it a go really, really gently, you know, and I also, and I warn every woman, like your vagina's really dry down there. So it's, it might well sting. And although if you Should actually worry about that stinging, because that's the thing too, they go, Oh, I can't use it because it's, it stung me. Um, you, if, can you work through that stinging? Yes. Or you, when should you worry about the sting? Well, I, I, I mean, I, so you should always get yourself examined. That's what I would say, because you don't want to be assuming that everything is genital urinary syndrome of menopause. So I think, you know, you need somebody who knows what they're doing. And actually, your GP practice nurse is, you know, um, that should be your first port of call. She's used to be, she's doing all your smears, everything like that. So she's well, used to it. Last time I went, because it was so impossible for me to get somebody to actually have a look at my vulva, to which I've said to my husband, somebody has to look at my vulva and he's a well, we don't drive a Volvo, but um, when I finally got around to having a, a cervical smear and I said to the nurse, I said, look, can you just have a look at the skin because nobody else has been able to with the, during COVID or whatever. She said, I'm not trained. 
She's like, she was trained to do the smear, but not uh -huh. trained to actually assess the skin. And I thought, what a waste. That's just so disappointing to hear, isn't it? Because actually they're your first, you know, they're doing smears. The smear isn't just about your cervix, is it? You know, you're you're looking at your pelvic health you're looking at your prolapses um i mean I, I you know i worked with a wonderful practice nurse up on lock find she was amazing and she would just you know she came in to you and said to you this woman has got whatever you know mm -hmm. down there then you listen to her because she knew exactly now she'd been at it for you know 30 plus years um i think if you've got an experienced practice nurse i, I would definitely Practice nurse would be your first port of call. Get somebody to have a look down below um, because you can't just, you don't want to go down that rabbit hole of assuming that everything is just genital urinary syndrome menopause. But um, to go back to your question about drying and cracking, you may have drying and cracking on the outside and, and that's quite common if you're so dry, but actually you have that drying and cracking in the inside and the, and the micro tears uh, when you have a good look in. And so that's why it tends to sting a wee bit. So... Mm. And you, you can't just say to a woman, well, you can't use vaginal estrogen until that's cleared up because it's never going to clear up. You, you need the vaginal estrogen to make it clear up. So you just go gently. Um, HR to our menopause mantra, start low, go slow. Yeah, I think at the moment, so externally, she's using Vagifem internally and Humivate um, externally. So maybe it might be an idea to, to throw, get it looked at and throw in the um, Avestin. I would get rid of the Vagifem because it's that hard plastic applicator. So get rid of that. Maybe try some Blissel. That's what I would do. Yeah, there you go. And you can use Blissel on the outside as well. You can use that in your labia. I, I, you know, Blissel's fabulous for, for that real dryness. Excellent. Well, there you go. Two choices. Um, we are up to the hour. In fact, we're over. So I will end this on the Instagram first because otherwise we'll probably lose it. So thank you very much, Alison. Um, oh, thank people you can so find you at all the course. And, um, and we will speak again soon. And let me end that there because otherwise I may well lose it and over to this one um I'm just because we're all over the place now thank you that was really great I really enjoyed that and um and again for people here on on Facebook Twitter and YouTube um you can be found at health and menopause with the very very lovely Alison Duffy take care and we will speak to you soon thanks so much really enjoyed that it was great thanks, thanks. bye bye bye